Okay, we're winding down. <clears throat> this is my last lecture of the day, <clears throat> but not of my life. And the title is just the same title because I used it. We only have a few topics, uh, and I want to get down at the very end is where we get to the religious part of the presentation. So this is the advanced stuff. Uh, probably don't need to pay a whole lot of attention to all this. Some of this will be interesting to some of you and not to others, and that's fine. Uh, we, we in the Open ACC committee, were pressed by our users, people like you, to try to provide API function call versions of all the directives and directive versions of all the function calls. So some people want, particularly C programmers, want more explicit controls. They want to be able to do this with a function call than with a directive. And so most of the directives over there have something, an API version that does something similar and so on. And this ACC is present. There's no directive version thereof, but this is you can test, do a runtime test to see if data lives on the GPU. In this case, it returns true or false. True if all the data is present. False if any of the data is not present. You don't get a different result for partially present. We talked about multiple devices, so um, you can use an environment variable to select what device to use. We've had people do this with their MPI run, have it run a script that sets the environment variable that then launches the program. This is each selected GPU. You can use ACC set device num, as um, you've probably used. You can use it in OpenMP or in MPI. Um, and I, I guess whether or not Cray does it with OpenMP, I think what happens with Cray with OpenACC inside OpenMP is it cannot be lexically inside the same, in the same function or routine. It's got to be, yeah, so you can do open ACC inside a routine that's inside open MP parallelism, but not in the same routine. And similarly, so we've already seen that. And this is the, <clears throat> we've already seen this and uh, with open MP. And so you set device nums, that's sticky, right? That's part of the state now of that thread. So we'll use that GPU uh, until you do another set device num. And um, now, what could possibly go wrong? Oh, here's a good one. So what could possibly go wrong, right? I've done the data collect, and I've done a parallel loop, and then I've done the ACC parallel loop. Is this all going to work? Um, well, it's on two different devices. Which thread was active for this data directive? That was the master thread. So that data is being copied onto the GPU for the master thread. The other thread, which is now active inside here, the data has not been copied on. So now when it gets to this pair of the loop, the data is not present. So now the compiler is going to say, well, it's not present, so I guess I better copy it over to that GPU. And then that data will come back here. And maybe it's going to be smart enough to say, oh, it's only doing it for that column J. So there'll be a lot of data traffic for the second GPU here. And for the first GPU, it will eventually come down here and then copy all its data back, overwriting any updates from, this, from the second thread and the second GPU. So this is not a good way to write that. Uh, you could put the data copy inside the OpenMP parallel, and then you've got the data will be present on both GPUs, right? It should just work. Except I put the whole array on both GPUs, and one of them is going to copy the data back at the end after the other one, and so it's going to overwrite the update. So it's a challenge. Uh, it would be great if they were more naturally integrated. And oh my god, I want to put OMP do ACC parallel loop on the same do loop because I want to spread it. Uh, yeah, great. That's not going to work. It would be great if they were more naturally uh, and fully integrated. Um, that's really hard, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. And what if you just have one thread and you want to use multiple devices from one thread? OK, what if you have a nail and you want to pound it through your fist? I mean, it's, just, it's a real challenge. We have done this, and you, you end up doing things like set your device number and compute your bounds and do all your stuff asynchronously because you want to go back around to set the device number and move the data and launch some kernels on the second device and go back around and whatever. So yes, you can do that, but it's really ugly. Uh, it's, it's not designed for, 
we have no, no um, um, let's see, it's a challenge, and we would be glad to take someone's advice in how to make this more natural. Absolutely. It's a problem you get. The K80 is two GPUs on a board. So from the software, it just looks like two GPUs. Uh, okay, so we already talked about this with MPI. It's separate processes, so data is not shared in the separate processes, so data will not be shared on the device. And yes, you can run out of memory. And uh, with OpenMP, it would be shared, and there was supposed to be a slide in there about that, but that's okay. Um, atomic operations. So OpenMP has added atomic operations. I'm sorry, OpenACC has added atomic operations, just like the OpenMP atomic operations. I think most are all of the same ones. So it's ACC atomic. You've got update, capture, and write, atomic write. Um, and there's particular forms you put these in. And capture, you can either capture the original value of the updated or the post value of the update. And um, if you have, okay, it, it's, it's obvious what these are. And so these are great, and in many cases they will uh, translate to uh, one or two target GPU instructions when you're running this on the GPU. In some cases, not. In some cases, uh, like uh, if this were a double complex update, well, there's no hardware for double complex atomic updates, so that turns into a <clears throat> a critical section, which is somewhat more expensive. A question came up, and I see this in the presentations. Fortran derived types. We have drive types and arrays of derived types with arrays that are members of the arrays of drive types. And we need to put this whole data structure over on the device, and it should, it should just work. So... Um, uh, this is what uh, we in the OpenACC committee call deep copy, right? You've got an array, and then it's got pointers to other arrays, and maybe they have pointers to other arrays. The, um, one of the uh, weather models, it's CSCS, and I can't remember if it's ICON or something else. It's at least three deep. And, okay, in that case, it's Fortran, which is somewhat easier uh, than in C++. And... Um, it's the allocatable members. So in OpenACC, we're working very hard, and you'll see this is targeted for the 3.0 specification to have something that's well-defined and will then be implemented and supported. It's a lot of work to implement. That's a technical issue. Um, but defining it, we need to define it in a way that it's simple enough to use but rich enough to be useful. And so the, the problems are... Some members, well, maybe you want to control which direction. This, this, this member is input only, this member is output only. Or maybe only some members you want to move over because it's a big structure. You say, well, I, this data should stay on the host, but this data needs to move over. Or maybe for this data region you want to move some members over, and the other data region you want to move the other members over. So now it, it becomes context sensitive. So there's, it's a, there were the challenges we need to be able to address. And then, of course, in C or C++, you have to have a way to define the size because the size comes from some other thing. Uh, and for C++, it damn well better work with standard template library vector. So the workaround today for PGI is as follows. And there's the good part and the bad part. Okay, this is... PGI only, it's not in the standard, and Cray does not implement this, and I don't think anyone else does yet either. <clears throat> so using, you can do this with a data directive as well, but I'll use enter and exit data because it's easier to show. You copy in the base derived type, and that could be a whole array. But you copy in the base derived type, and then for each member, copy in the member. Now, if it was an array of derived type, this would be, X would be an array, and you have to copy in X sub I percent XM for each value of I. And when you copy in a derived type member, like uh, a, uh, an allocatable member, what it will do is it'll copy in that, uh, that data, that allocatable data, and then update the pointer on the device 
with the device address. So it does the right thing. And then when you come out, you want to copy them out or delete them in reverse order. But what it does not do yet today is fix that pointer on the device to point back to the host data so that when I copy back the base derived type, I still have host addresses in there. So today you can't copy back the base derived type because it'll have the wrong addresses. Um, we know how to fix that and we'll get that fixed. And, uh, but that's essentially this is what the deep copy would do more or less automatically. But okay, that's, that's today's workaround and that works in Fortran and in uh, C++. Okay, there it is with X being an array and it's not pretty, but it's a starting point today. There it is. And then the other way to try to do this is with managed memory. And I think I mentioned this once or twice uh, yesterday or today. So we have this, uh, this is another PGI feature, T equals Tesla colon managed. And I'll have to admit, uh, a year ago, I was a managed memory skeptic. I mean, when we get to Pascal and Volta time frame with NVLink and high speed interfaces and hardware support on the device to take a page fault, all right, then managed memory has a hope of working. But how possibly can managed memory work on a Kepler where every time I launch a kernel, any managed memory that's on the host has to be migrated over to the device because there's no way for the device to take a fault and say it's not there yet. So it all has to be there. How can that possibly work? So we did an experiment where we hacked together this T equals Tesla colon manage. And so what works, and, and we put all the, all the dynamically allocated data in managed memory, and then we ran it. And we ran it over the spec Excel open ACC benchmarks. What we found was um, some of them, you couldn't tell the difference. Some of them really couldn't tell the difference because they had no dynamic data, but um, and that's good. Um, some of them did have dynamic data, but it was, it was a wash. Some of them were a little bit slower, but no slowdowns. The worst slowdown was uh, just over 10%. One of them sped up. And, uh, I forgot which one it was now. Swim or SP sped up. And the reason it speeds up is when you do a dynamic allocation in CUDA managed memory, it's an expensive allocate because it allocates device memory and it allocates host pinned memory. And allocating host pinned memory is expensive. Host pinned memory is not just pin in the memory, it's, it's pinned in contiguous memory on the host. So it's got to have a physical address that's contiguous. Uh, but because it's pinned, the data transfers are really fast. So the data transfers are done by the CUDA driver, not by, the soft, not by your software, not by the application, and not by OpenACC runtime. Um, but the transfers go really quickly because it's pinned memory. So in that case, it, there was a lot of data transfer and it, it ran faster. Okay, so the advantages of using T equals Tesla colon manage, and again, it only works for dynamically allocated memory. There's no hope that it's on Kepler that it'll ever have anything to do with stack or local or uh, global memory, static memory. Um, uh, so when it, when it runs, if you, when the files you compile with that flag, allocate and deallocate will be done with uh, CUDA managed memory, and if you're in C++, new and delete, and if you're in C, malloc and free we're all done from managed memory and so most of the data clauses you will just more or less get ignored and in fact the compiler does exactly what it would normally do and figure out what data is being used and, be, and if the data clauses aren't there it'll imply something and it'll see whether the data is, is present on the device and because it's managed oh it's managed memory is by definition all present and if locality works it's great um, it's uh, really good when you're experimenting and doing initial porting because then you can focus on the fun part which is moving your kernels over and, and then later on optimize your data transfers uh, and obviously drive type pointers just work. But there are disadvantages and I'm going to be a little more explicit about this than we were earlier. This is, we already mentioned this, there's no prefets, so you don't get to control when the data movement happens. I already mentioned that. It's limited to the size of the GPU. So you've got 12 gigabytes of uh, GPU memory. You've got 12 gigabytes of dynamic allocation. That's the size of your, your working set. The allocate and deallocate are pretty expensive. 
The deallocate is even more expensive. And you're saying, well, how can the deallocate be more expensive? Well, because when it's deallocating device memory, it needs to make sure that there's no kernels executing that might still want that device memory. So it basically has to synchronize with the device. So any asynchronicity going on, that's it. It stops everything and then deallocates the memory. Uh, only works on one device. So you've got two devices on your node. Well, no, now you only have one. And uh, Jeremy mentioned this yesterday. If, if you have simultaneous host and device access, while the kernel is running on the device and you access the beta from the, on the host, your program will seg fault. They put that in on purpose because they can't make it co data coherent. And so the people working on the driver decided it's safer to seg fault your program than let you have incoherent access. So, all right. Um, a couple other um, uh, advanced things. The uh, ACC on device, this is a call that could go inside your kernel to say, if I'm executing, and the argument has to be uh, one of these constant device types. If I'm executing on the NVIDIA device, then do this. And if I'm executing on the host device, then do that. Actually, these seem like they're backwards, right? It should be dev foo in the then part and host foo in the else part, but nevertheless. And what actually happens, the compiler will, when it reaches this and is compiling code for the device, it turns this into a dot true, and that code gets dead, that would get dead and code eliminated. And when it's compiling for the host, this turns into a dot false, and that code gets dead code eliminated. So it's not the same as a pound if def, but you get much of the same behavior. Um, and so in this case, for instance, um, we've seen examples where people do this. They have an if clause on their compute construct where they're deciding dynamically should this go on the GPU or not based on maybe the size of the loop or whether the data is present or what have you. And then, but you can have it do different, uh, different algorithms based on whether it's compiled for the host or the device. And the way you compile it for host and device, well, if there's an if clause, it'll always generate two versions. And I mentioned this yesterday, you can say Tesla comma host, and for every compute region will generate a GPU version and a host version, and then when the program starts up, if there's a GPU, it'll use it, and if not, it'll run on the host. And we've had people use this when they have a cluster and some nodes have devices and some nodes don't. Uh, the issue being, of course, this is sequential code on the host, not parallel code on the host. Oh, certainly. It's, yes, the host can be OpenMP, yes. Okay, now multi-core. Um, all right. So this is new. This is, uh, it's a, as I mentioned yesterday, I think it's available on 15.7 with an additional download. I don't know if it's installed here. I didn't check. Uh, but it will be available in 15.9 overall, and you'll get that once it comes out, uh, which apparently won't be till I get back to Portland. And T equals Tesla comma multi-core is not working in 15.9. It will work in 2016, so then you'll be able to generate parallel code for host and device. Now, if you're running with OpenMP parallelism, maybe that's not what you want, and that's fine. You know, we, have, we have no problem with that, but um, some people do. In some situations you do. Um, and I think I mentioned yesterday, it's not at all tuned. It's, it, it won't collapse loops. It chooses one of the outer loops to run in parallel and assumes it's going to do auto vectorization for the vector operations. So these are all fruitful areas of future development. We'll be working on that for the next year. And, um, uh, and I have some results uh, at the end here. Now some interoperability. So interoperability with OpenMP, we've had a uh, discussion about this earlier, and the intent is the, there's not, there are words in the language to define the behavior when you have multiple host threads. Uh, it doesn't use the word OpenMP, but it does talk about multiple threads, and with PGI, they can coexist and should coexist politely, and that'll get better in 15.9. As I said, there appears to be a race condition even in 15.7. Uh, data regions can overlap, the, and uh, data will be shared on the device. Uh, okay. What you don't want to do is have one thread put one section of an array, and the other thread put a different section of the same array onto the same device. 
well, you just don't want to do that because now when it's testing whether the array A is present, well, it's present in two different places, but it's not all the same place. So, so don't do that. Just don't do that. Now, interoperability with OpenMP4. So this is OpenMP4, the target directives. And today we have no existence proof. But we have people working on both OpenMP4 and OpenACC. And uh, uh, both the language and in the, in the compilers. And I believe the following is true. And this is an uh, informed opinion but again, there's no proof, that um, data management of the two specifications should be coherent. So if you have a, an implementation that does do both, OMP4 target and OpenACC, in pieces of your code you're using one, other pieces of code you're using the other, uh, the, the data constructs should be completely interoperable. So um, OpenMP uses map, OpenACC uses copy, and they more or less map coherently from one to the other. The OpenM's ACC model defines that when you're inside the, the data region, you've got two copies, you need to keep them coherent. OpenMP doesn't really do that as carefully. It seems to define that the data gets mapped to the device, and then it's mapped back, and so there's really one copy, and you define where it is right now, although uh, it, it doesn't seem to be strictly that way. Um, the parallelism management is quite a bit different, and um, they each have three levels of parallelism. And uh, the reason why OpenACC has three levels, I mentioned part of this yesterday, but even for things like Knight's Landing, you've got threads, or sorry, you've got cores, you've got vector operations, and then within the core you have four-way multi-threading. And so parallelism across the cores and parallelism across the threads in a core is a little bit different. You can, you can treat them all the same, but if you're really doing optimization, then parallelism of the threads in a core, well, they're going to share cache. So they're, they're kind of closer together. You want those to be using the same data, whereas parallelism across cores, you want to not be using the same data because you don't want your cache thrashing. So... Uh, if you want to micro-optimize, that's, anyway, we had, when we were designing OpenACC, we had that in mind. It wasn't Knight's Landing then, it was Knight's Ferry, I think, but nevertheless. Um, but OpenMP, the big difference is OpenMP is strictly prescriptive. When I say do a parallel loop, it means do that loop across threads. When I say do uh, distribute loop, that means do that across teams. And by God, there's no other way to do that. Whereas on something like a Knight's Landing, what is this teams stuff? You don't need teams. I don't want teams. I just want threads. Just map everything to threads. And, and I don't want to have to write OMP target teams distribute parallel do SIMD or something. I just want to say parallel loop. Run it in parallel. Whereas with OpenACC, when you have a parallel loop, it's defined as this is a parallel loop. And someone said, they wrote, I wrote this article on HPC Wire that describes the difference between the parallelism models. OpenMP says, run this loop in parallel across my threads, teams, or SIMD lanes. And OpenACC says, this is a parallel loop. And here's how to map it on the device. But it's a truly parallel loop. And it's a difference in philosophy. And you would not believe the, the, the level of acrimony that goes under that discussion. Okay. Nevertheless, the same runtime ought to be able to handle the both. So, I see no reason that any implementation that wants to do both couldn't put them both into the same program. And we are going to get to it, uh, OMP4 target on devices like GPUs, but not in the coming year. We talk about interoperability with CUDA. And uh, so we have uh, two uh, issues that the uh, data and compute interoperability. And I'll talk a little bit about CUDA C and CUDA Fortran separately with, um, with these two. So can I use OpenACC data in CUDA C? Well, you've seen some of that. I've got OpenACC data constructs. 
And then I want to call a routine like an MPI send, which is expecting a CUDA pointer. Well, then I can, I can use the host data construct to say pass the device address instead of the host address for that pointer. Can I use CUDA data inside OpenACC? Well, in CUDA C, I would do a CUDA malloc, blah, 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 blah. And then inside my OpenACC region would say, well, this is now a device pointer because it was allocated already by on the device. I guarantee this pointer is valid on the device. Um, what's the difference between these two? Oh, Fortran. C calling Fortran. And the difference between C calling Fortran is I need to decorate the routine name or have a bind C on my Fortran routine to uh, give it a C name binding. What about CUDA Fortran data in OpenACC? Well, so far there's only one CUDA Fortran compiler, so this one I'm pretty sure we can make work. So if you have CUDA Fortran data, then what you do that is give it the device attribute. And I pass it in with the device attribute, and the compiler knows that, oh, it's on the device. It's got the device attribute. I'm compiling this with, with the mCUDA flag, so there it is. Um, and this one, uh, OpenACC data in CUDA Fortran. So now the, the, this is assuming there's an explicit interface or an exposed interface for the CUDA Fortran routine. I put some data on the device with my data construct. I call a CUDA Fortran routine that has the device attribute on the argument. Well, then the compiler says, oh, here's A. I know I'm in a data region. I know it's on the device, so I will find the device address and pass that because that's what he's expecting. So, so there's that. And uh, you can even, if you're compiling with uh, the mCUDA flag, um, call a CUDA Fortran kernel directly because it's the same compiler. And uh, it knows enough that, same thing, this has got to be a device address, so it passes the device address for my OpenACC data. Now what about, so that's uh, data interoperability. What about compute interoperability? And so um, can I call CUDA device routines from OpenACC? And CUDA Fortran, it's relatively easy. I, let's see here. I can, in my routine, do a call, and in the routine, in the interface block, say this is a sequential routine, and then implement that with CUDA, CUDA C or CUDA Fortran. And, um, so here's the CUDA C implementation of that. Um, Value arguments versus reference arguments. You'd have to know how that translated into C. So the value arguments will come across in C as a value, and arrays or reference arguments will come across as pointers to the data. And because here I had bind C on the interface block, it will call that name without the Fortran decoration. So that should just work. That's your device routine. Uh, you can call CUDA Fortran device routine because I declare it as a device routine and the compiler says, oh, it knows how to interpret that. And so I can call that routine directly from my um, OpenACC region. And it will just, it'll just work. Um, this is a summary of what I just said. And um, so one difference between NVCC and PGI compilers if, you're, if you've ever compiled with CUDA, you're building it with NVCC, and they have this flag called RDCs, Relocatable Device Code. The default with NVCC is you're not going to use a linker, so all your CUDA binaries are self-contained inside this one file. So you can't have any cross-file, no external references across files. The default with PGI is um, you're writing a program, not a file, and you need to link. And so we're going to turn relocatable, generate relocatable device code, and so that's turned on. So 
in this particular example I had up here with the CUDA C code, you would need to compile this and turn relocatable device code to on, so this becomes an external reference that could be satisfied when linked with the code that calls it. All right. Um, CUDA libraries. So we have this, uh, uh, for CUDA Fortran in particular, I'm sorry, for OpenACC Fortran in particular, and, and CUDA Fortran, we have defined interfaces to the four of the common CUDA libraries there. And we have uh, Fortran modules, Kublas and QRAND and so on. And a missing one. Qsparse, somewhere I missed Qsparse. We have modules that give the uh, interfaces, and so you use the module and then make the calls directly, and the module will do appropriate um, matching for the uh, type and whether it's you're using device data or host data. And I mentioned briefly yesterday, and I'll say again, um, these things will run on a stream, and the default is they'll run on the null stream. So when you use this flag, it changes the OpenACC implementation, the runtime, to use the null stream as the default synchronous stream. So it'll match the default stream for Kublas or QFFT. And if you're going to do asynchronous, um, uh, I'm sorry, and that behavior is in 15.9, not 15.7, uh, but if you're going to do asynchronous operations and you want to use an asynchronous on the OpenACC, then you want to do your QFFT or Kublas in the same stream. And the way you would do that is uh, call the appropriate set stream and getting the CUDA stream for that asynchronous value. So if you were running this on asynchronous 1 or asynchronous the default or what have you, you would get the default stream. Um, and thrust we have worked with as well, although I don't think we have a module for to interface with thrust. But we have some. We've had examples. Um, uh, this is uh, here. I'm whining. OpenMP versus OpenACC. They're both great, right? And we hope they will at some point come together. But here's the religious part of the discussion. So here are the nodes you're working on usually today. You've got one or two high-performance multi-core processors, each with a large high-capacity memory and a high bandwidth interconnect between them, either quick path if it's Intel or hypertransport if it's AMD. And this is the accelerated node of today. You've got one high-performance multi-core processor, probably, maybe two, but often just one, with a high-capacity memory, and then a mediocre PCI Express bus connection to a very highly parallel accelerator, in this case a GPU, with a very, very high bandwidth connection to a relatively small uh, high bandwidth memory. Um, let me digress for a minute. So this is the latency-optimized cores versus throughput-optimized cores. Now, in order to make a processor run faster, this is, you're taking all the resources on the chip. You want to make it run as fast as possible. There's only three things you can do. This is the computer architect in me trying to come out. One of them is make a faster clock. And we're pretty much done there. Uh, the fastest clock I've seen in a, in a uh, commercial microprocessor was a 5 gigahertz power. You know, IBM had a 5 gigahertz power chip at one point. Uh, the fastest uh, x86 I've seen, uh, Intel had at one point a 4 gigahertz processor. And we're not talking about overclocking. We're talking about you know, the, the rated speed. Um, they're getting slower. I think the fastest today from Intel is a 3.2 gigahertz. AMD is somewhat slower. So the... Clocks are in the you know, 3 gigahertz range, but um, not going much over that, and they're not going to get any faster. Right. 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 Uh, right. Intel tried in the early 2000s their, their progression. They were hitting 3 gigahertz, and they were going to go up as fast as they could, and they, 
It, it was not working. Whereas GPUs have a relatively slow clock, it's more or less about one gigahertz, sometimes measurably less, sometimes a little bit more, but about one gigahertz. So they get their performance. And remember, we're talking about performance, not clock speed. They get their performance not from the clock. Okay, so that's either you get a faster clock or you do more work per clock. And there's many ways to do more work per clock. For instance, pipelining, right? This is where Intel really went whole hog. And it's 1925 stages of pipeline to make the stages really small so they can say we've got a faster clock than AMD, so our processor is faster. Well, may not be getting as much work done per clock, but by God, their clock speed is fast, and that's what people compare. I want the 3 gigahertz, not the 2 gigahertz. You know, run your program. Does it run faster? Doesn't matter. It's a faster clock. That's what I want. So more work per clock. Pipelining will let you get more instructions in flight or multi-scalar instruction issues. So I can do two or three or four or five or more instructions issued per cycle. And all these take a hell of a lot of transistor real estate in your control unit and in your processing unit for all the pipeline stage hardware, for the instruction dispatch unit. Um, there's a lot of real estate. You think of the transistor real estate as, uh, you know, this is a town, and, and how many of your blocks are going to be corresponding to making sure that you can issue multiple instructions at a time. And they do this because they want each thread to run as fast as possible, because that's, that's what they're doing. Or more work per clock, SIMD instructions. And that's pretty much a no-brainer if you've got the real estate to afford that, because now you've got one instruction that does four times as much work. That's great. If you can use those SIMD instructions, it's great. Um, one wonders how many Intel processors have never used a SIMD instruction because they're only running PowerPoint. Or, or you put more cores, and that's, okay, parallelism. It's, that's easy to manage conceptually. It's a little bit harder to implement, but nevertheless, it's uh, relatively straightforward. Uh, whereas a GPU basically has a pretty shallow pipeline, not much multi-level multi-scalar instructions, much, much wider SIMD code, and many, many, many more cores. And when I say core, I don't mean CUDA core. CUDA core is, a, is, a, is an SSE lane, basically. I mean the, the number of, of uh, and I don't mean SM units either, because each SM unit is more or less uh, 12 cores. Um, but there are a lot of, uh, of equivalents to a CPU core on a GPU chip. And then fewer stalls. So a stall happens typically when you're running along and you've got to take a branch and you don't know which way you're going to branch. So what are you going to do? Well, either you wait to, to decide which way direction you're going to go or you decide one and start going that direction and that's the branch prediction. And, and if you went the wrong direction, you squash those instructions and, and go the right way. Or you're running along and bam, you're waiting on memory. It missed in the cache. Now what do I do? I have to wait for memory. And you just stall and wait for memory or you do something else. So the Intel approach and the AMD approach, the CPU approach is larger caches, so you get fewer of these stalls. Out of order execution, so that one instruction stalls or something else can be executing. Or multi-threading, so in a CPU, the multi-threading depth is two to four. And the idea with multi-threading is you're running along and this thread stalls, all right, I'll start another thread. I've got the state ready in another register file. I can be executing it right away. Is that hyper-threading? Intel calls that hyper-threading, yes. This is the more general term. And a simultaneous multi-threading. And there's a slight difference. So, and I don't know how much detail you want to get into. So the two ways to implement multi-threading is one thread executes till the stalls and you start another thread. Or if you're really clever, you can start fetching instructions from two different threads because you've got a lot of functional units and this one's doing integer and this one's doing float so you can get them all going. That's the simultaneous, real simultaneous multi-threading. And I don't know if, if, if IBM, which one IBM does. Whereas on a GPU, the caches are minuscule. There's basically no branch prediction, usually in order execution, but a hell of a lot of multi-threading. Now, over here I've highlighted in green where uh, you're getting more work or more uh, performance from the CPU. And here I've highlighted in green where the GPU is getting more performance. You notice on the GPU accelerator side, all those green numbers are parallelism numbers. It's getting all its performance from parallelism. So to get performance, you need to provide a lot more parallelism on a, on a GPU or on an accelerator because it's not going to run fast if it's not highly parallel. Okay, so we saw the previous uh, accelerated node. 
This would be the corresponding, this is yesterday's Xeon Phi, right? No one's going to be using these uh, in the very near future. But this is uh, AMD APU today, and you can get these. And they're, they're, when their software works, this should be pretty good. So they put the GPU on the chip with the CPU. They share cache. Now, this is great because the data movement problem should basically go away. The coherence problem should basically go away. Um, but they, have, they don't have a high bandwidth memory, so that's an issue. They're depending on the cache um, for the memory bandwidth. But um, it's an interesting design decision and uh, worth exploring. Um, this is tomorrow's Xeon 5 with Knight's Landing. So now, just like a GPU, I have a high capacity memory and I've got a smaller, much, much smaller high bandwidth memory. Much smaller because it's more expensive. I can't afford a big one. If I could afford a big one, I just, right, you just can't have it. But highly parallel, longer vectors, more multi threading, not much more, but more multi threading. So the same, some of the same design decisions that are put on a GPU are in this Knight's Landing. Smaller cache. Okay, Knight's Landing, the cache is double the size of the Knight's Corner, even though it's only got 10% or 20% more cores. Um, and uh, I've seen pictures like this. I'm not making any announcements. These are just informed opinions of uh, AMD saying they will, be have, they will have an APU with a high bandwidth memory attached and a high capacity memory. So now this is, the, this is addressing the missing point for the APU. That'll be a really exciting uh, development. Knight's Landing. Yeah, yeah. They actually have two, two types of memory on there. Now. Sure, yeah. Um, and they've got some high speed cores on here, which the Knight's Landing does not have. So this will be a very interesting device once it's uh, available. And um, uh, Jeremy showed you we'll be having a power CPU with NVLink. So it's the same picture before, but now this bandwidth is really high. It's almost the same as memory bandwidth, it's within a small factor of memory bandwidth. So now, maybe data movement is not such a big deal. In fact, you know, maybe if the data is on the wrong side, you just leave it there and pay the latency overhead, uh, pay the bandwidth difference, because it's not worth moving if it's not being referenced very often. It's only when the data gets referenced very often. And we'll have hardware here that can take page faults. So now uh, the whole business of the managed memory, well, basically all the memory should be managed at some point. Um, it needs some fixes in the operating system, probably, but um, if all the data can be moved over dynamically by the OS or driver, then data management, if locality works, then the data management problem goes away. It just moves when you need it. It comes off when it gets evicted or is needed on the other side. This is a real possibility here because... Uh, yes, the cache has to be coherent. You're right. And yes, they would have to be coherent. I don't know what the, that means. That's a very good point. I don't have an. I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, not that I'm not saying. I just don't know. And um, we're going to be seeing these with ARM. These are available today, if you want to spend the money. ARM CPUs are within. Uh, not a not a tiny fraction, but a small fraction of performance of a good Xeon. Um, the high performance ARM CPUs are pretty good. They don't have um, you you can get C's with four four high performance cores now, and maybe more than four, or a boatload of low performance cores. So you can make it look like this, or make it look like a Xeon, and, and that's not bad. And maybe put you know one big one and many little ones. It looks like an APU. There's a lot of interesting design decisions here, and. I'm guessing at some point somebody will implement, I'm only, there's only a guess, this is a non-informed opinion, but I'm guessing somebody's going to implement NVLink to an ARM core. Um, I'm guessing nobody's going to implement NVLink to an x86 core. But that's just a guess. Okay, point being, there's a wide variety of what we can guess will be available over the next few years, just from what we see today. Ten years ago, as I said yesterday, ten years ago, I challenge anybody to tell me they predicted that GPUs would be uh, standard operating procedure in the top 500. I, wouldn't, I don't believe anybody could have said that. 
and now we accept it. Uh, Ten years from now, what are we going to be programming? We basically don't know. If Intel has their way, and they could, we'll be programming with uh, multi-core Xeons. They'll call it Xeon Phi, but it'll just be Xeons. Um, uh, and, and, you know, things could happen. That could work. Or we'll have some other more rich architecture. And it's not just the compute architecture. This memory system uh, is an issue. Can it all be managed implicitly? And I want to go back to the Xeon Phi picture, the Knight's Landing picture. So this one, you've got two memories. They've got basically three modes of operation. Well, it's really two modes and a mixed mode. And the first mode is what they call flat, which means if you want data in here, you allocate it in here. And then you copy it from the, from the one side to the other side. So it's, it's application controlled. Okay, well, that looks like open ACC data constructs to me, and then the open ACC runtime could manage this memory for you. Uh, the other mode is uh, essentially cache mode, where uh, the slide I saw that had Intel's name on it said the hardware will manage data movement from the high capacity to the high bandwidth rate. Yeah, no. It's going to be the operating system. It'll be a page fault. That's an this is an informed opinion here, but it'll take a page fault, and it'll move the page in and fix the page table so that other future references come out of here. And it probably won't be the first time a page fault happens. It'll probably be, if you refer to the same page enough times, then it'll move the page over to this side. and, and uh, refer to it from there. And, and maybe it's only data pages, probably not instruction pages, so only for data fetches, not instruction fetches. But, um, but no, the only hardware that's going to be used to move data from here to there will be these cores running the operating system. Um, but it's, it's a reasonably exposed memory hierarchy. Uh, and now there's something we need to start thinking about. It's the same memory hierarchy we're seeing here, and we're seeing here, and we're seeing Right, in a lot of these pictures. So that's another level of complexity. Complexity is a challenge and an opportunity. And why do we need the complexity? Because we can't afford the system we want. What we really want is 64 high performance cores and one big, one huge high bandwidth, low latency memory. Can't afford that. Um, all right. Okay, and I'm going to finish up here with uh, performance portability. So we, we being PGI now, have been saying that this directive-based programming model um, targeting highly parallel systems can provide performance portability across a wide variety of systems. We've been saying that, and we believed it, but we could not demonstrate it. We eventually implemented this on NVIDIA. We also implemented it on AMD GPUs, and we showed some performance results earlier that had... Um, the benchmarks running on the AMD and benchmarks running on NVIDIA, and sometimes one was faster, sometimes the other was faster, and the reason seemed to be that one had more single precision in memory bandwidth, the other had more double precision bandwidth, but, you know, it it's, was a wash. But they're still both GPUs. And at some level of abstraction, the two GPUs look very similar to each other. What about something like the CPU and a GPU? How much performance portability can we provide across the two? And so I'm defining performance portability across multiple targets as specified, and I'm stating that we now have evidence that if you're using OpenACC, this is not inside OpenMP, but if you're using OpenACC, that we have evidence that it can provide performance portability across GPU and CPU. So I took six, and I did not cherry pick these, I just took six that I ran. These are spec Excel benchmarks not running in the harness, so Strictly speaking, these are spec estimates. And I ran them sequentially on the host. And um, one of these, uh, I had to run the smaller data set because the larger data set running sequentially took like a day. And so I couldn't run that one. And this is running on a 32 core dual processor Haswell. So it's two 16 core Haswells. And the GPU was a K80 using one of the GPUs of a K80, so it's a K40 basically, on that same uh, system. So it's head-to-head uh, -head comparison using the PGI 15.9 prototype. It's not been released yet. And uh, so these are the times and seconds and the speed up over sequential on one core and multi-core speed up over sequential on one core. And you can see uh, sometimes the GPU is faster. In this case, it's a lot faster. Sometimes the CPU is faster. 
And sometimes they're pretty close. So uh, two things to point out here. Um, the MD number and the O stencil number is where the GPU looks really good and the CPU looks not so good. And in both cases, the sequential time is really bad. And the MD time is just a really parallel code. And so it's running really well on 32 cores. And it also runs really well on a GPU, as you might expect. And there's not enough data movement to, there, there's not much data movement that needs to be amortized. So GPU looks pretty good. But the CPU looks really good, too. And the O-stencil code, the GPU looks astoundingly good. It looks actually almost unbelievably good. And it kind of is unbelievably good. And the, the, the CPU, not so much. And the reason is, the o, this is a benchmark code. And I talked to the guys who worked on this. And they wrote this specifically to run badly on a CPU. So it was like that, um, that uh, stencil code you guys had where the outer loop was a stride one loop. And that's not what you want to do on a CPU. You want the inner loop to be cash for cash locality. You want the inner loop to be stride one. And what I did not do was reorder the loops. And I expect this, this, the sequential time would go down. So this speed up would be much lower. And this speed up would be much higher. Um, so that's somewhat of an unfair comparison. But I mean, there it is. If what I also expect is uh, when we tune our multi-core version of OpenACC, it will be deciding which loops to run in parallel based on strides, among other things. And so then we'll get a better than 32 performance improvement on 32 cores because we'll do the right loop as the inner loop as opposed to the sequential loop, which does the wrong loop as the inner loop. But as I said, it's, uh, it's not there yet. Uh, and some of these, um, we kind of get really crappy performance. I mean, a speed up of four on some of these other codes. And here, OLBM, a speed up of 1.4, it just looks horrible. And well, it is what it is today. And uh, we have some challenges to make these things work. Um, but if you come to our booth, for those of you that come to uh, supercomputing, come to our booth, we will be uh, have more uh, evidence of uh, performance portability there and a description of our path to uh, multi-core and eventually Knight's Landing uh, implementation of this. Uh, and for Knight's Landing, it's much more important to get the, the vector instructions generated properly as well. And a little bit of, uh, of uh, marketing. So there is an online course starting October 1. It's free. It's eight weeks. It's an hour a week. And the odd number weeks, one, three, five, and seven, will be lectures, and they'll give assignments. And the even numbered weeks, two, four, six, eight, will be QA with the lecturers. Uh, if you don't have access to a GPU, they will give you access to a GPU, and you can register. Um, you've got copies of the slides. You can get it uh, from there. Um, this is uh, NVIDIA is running this. They've been running a similar course for deep learning. It's been very successful, so we're trying to reproduce that with OpenACC. Um, this is more marketing uh, challenges and opportunities, blah, 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 blah and some more uh, uh, resources. So PGI has a user form. If you have questions about your program or about OpenACC in general, you can use the PGI user form. It's monitored. We have a guy who looks at it every day and answers questions or forwards them to somebody who can. Uh, there's the uh, uh, NVIDIA site. For those of you that are academics, this is where you can get a free copy of the OpenACC toolkit, which includes the PGI compilers, the, uh, Open Ace, the CUDA toolkit information, some other SDK sample codes, and so on. Um, it's free. There are restrictions. It's node locked, but um, the price is right for academics. For the rest of us, we have to get a license. Um, this is the course. This is. Uh, uh, email for something, I've forgotten what for. And then the last bit about the uh, future of OpenACC itself. So we're here at 2.5. We've uh, we started out with something simple. We added routines and atomics and dynamic data lifetimes. 2.5, we're getting ready to um, ratify and distribute it. It doggone well better be done by November because we need to be handing those out at supercomputing. 
uh, adds a few things, it adds default present, it adds this profiler interface, which doesn't affect most of you, but um, it will in the sense that uh, tools like Vampyr and so on are going to interface to uh, profile open ACC codes and be able to tie the data movement and the kernel execution to the original source code through this profiler interface. And so that's, that's pretty slick. And what our, once we ratify that, we'll go back to working on 3.0 and we have two or three really important uh, things we need to worry about. One of them is this whole deep copy issue. How are we going to manage deep copy? Another one is this whole deep memory hierarchy, the exposed memory hierarchy. So even if the address space is shared, but I get to move the data, and I get to choose where to move the data, how am I going to manage that and expose that to the programmer? That's, that's going to be good. And maybe you don't have to. Maybe it can all be done implicitly by the runtime and the operating system, which would be great. Um, that's, that would be the perfect direction to move into. And there's a few other uh, smaller items, and there, there's one other bigger one, and I can't remember what it was now. Probably, I don't know what it was. And I think that's as far as I, that's as far as I go. So that's the religious part. You all been very attentive. Any comments or questions? Have there been any attempts to try to get uh, the uh, device attributes into a uh, formal Fortran standard? Uh, that's an interesting question. There has been discussion inside NVIDIA to try to get CUDA Fortran into the Fortran standard. I think that would be a challenge to get through the Fortran committee. So, um, well, they, got they did get Coarray Fortran. Uh, and, and, you know, there are true believers. Uh, but there's another one. I'm a Coarray Fortran skeptic. I think it'll work great on a Cray and not so great anywhere else because no one else has the hardware. Sure. Uh, I've seen good performance on Titan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we have not implemented that yet. Um, it's on the list, although there's, there's the challenges each interface is different, and I believe uh, Cray has the right hardware, so you can make it work great on a Cray. I don't know we under, know that all the hardware tricks to make it work, or can, can know. But getting it to work anywhere else well, I think, is going to be a real challenge. And I don't, I just have no clues how to do that. But, you know, challenges are made for guy, compiler guys. Uh, I didn't really understand your last comment with respect to uh, how the operating system can sort of take over some of the memory management. Like yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So let's go back to uh, this picture. So inside here, there's an there's operating system managed a page table right, that tells for the virtual page where it lives in memory, and, and it can tell whether it lives here or here based on the physical address, right? and, or whether it's off in disk somewhere or just not been paged in or not even been accessed, in which case it doesn't have an address. And um, one could imagine, this is the informed opinion part, one could imagine the operating system, in, in the page table, you, know, you have a thing called the translation look aside buffer, the TLB, which is basically a page table cache in the core. And it's a very small cache, but it's very fast. It has to be fast because every memory access goes through the, this TLB. And one could imagine in the TLB to say um, if there are, on the 20th access to this page, take a page fault. And so pages would all start in my high capacity memory, and then I'll start executing. And then the 20th access to some page will say, you know, I'm accessing this page a hell of a lot. It'll take a page fault and say, I'm going to move that over here. And, okay, then it keeps on going, and some other pages get moved in. Eventually, all the stuff you're working on is inside here. 
And then you'd go to the next phase of your algorithm, and you're accessing different data. Oh, oh, some other pages come over here. Oh, it's full. I'll migrate something out. And so it's, it's just like paging from a disk, except you're paging from memory to some other memory. And you wouldn't necessarily take a page fault on the first access, right? the first miss from the high bandwidth memory, because you know, if you're only going to access one word, or you know, you've got a big table, you're accessing random locations, you don't want to uh, move it on the first access, but you know, 10th or 20th or some number. I don't, I don't know what the number is. But that would be, I would expect that to be the way this would work. Because if you treat it like a hardware cache, then you need A, I need a hardware cache tag table for every page in here. This is a 16 gigabyte memory, 4K caches. I need a million, I need, uh, I think it's 4 million entries in my cache tag table. I need to look up, um, let's see, how does this work? I need to, uh, okay. And then when I have a miss, I have to move 4K bytes into this area and maybe swap 4K bytes out. It's not just 16 bytes. It's a, it's a long latency operation. And I, I just don't see that happening in hardware. That's, you, have, you don't have enough real estate to implement that. And I've got 72 cores all doing this at the same time. I'm not buying that. Um, no, because the, it has to tell you, uh, you have to have your lookup, what's the virtual address, and where it lives inside. But you view the cache line as being the page. I, I hear you. 4K page, right? You move 4K. I, I hear you. You still need 4 million of those entries. 4K page, 16 gigabyte memory, that's, that's 4 million entries. Right, 20 megabyte cache with a 16 byte cache line. Okay, that's a million entries. But there, right, it's a two-way set associative. The address, you, it only needs to be, uh, the address will tell you which set to look at, and then you're only looking at two different entries here. Now you could probably do the same thing there, but you're gonna have more cache thrashing. And, and these are big pages to be thrashing. You don't wanna be thrashing at the page level. Okay, A, it's a hardware mode when you boot. Yes. And B, I'm telling you, it's not going to be hardware doing caching, it's the operating system doing caching. That's my informed opinion. And you can do this in the OS, and you won't need any extra hardware. Well, not much extra hardware. You just need very little extra hardware in your cache page fault mechanism, but no. I'll believe that when I see it, and it would be a it would be a bad use of hardware, but... Okay, prove me wrong. This is the architect in me getting all excited. Okay, any, anything else about anything? Anything else about anything? Donald Trump. I'm uh, imagining Donald Trump. I'm really rich. You Europeans, you need to get down on your feet and kiss my... And when he does, open your teeth and take a bite. That'll. Speak American now. Yeah. Yahete. <laughs> True American. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Thanks for your uh, attention all week. And I, uh, it was disappointing you guys didn't get any real speed ups on your mini applications. So we have to work on that. <laughs>